What is up, Brad fans? How you doing? Thank you so much for being here. On today's episode, I am joined by Marvin Doimishin, who is one of the founders of the Mind Foundation and the director of research and programs in the Mind Executive Board. Now, Longtime listeners of the show will know what the Mind Foundation is. Uh, it's a nonprofit group here in Germany based out of Berlin that does a lot of work with psychedelics. So research into psychedelics for treatment of depression. Uh, they've started a training program for therapists. I have covered their biannual conference, the Insight Conference, twice. Uh, and as you'll know, if you've listened to the program, they've been very kind to me and they're friends of the show. So Marvin came on to talk about another uh, initiative that the Mind Foundation has, specifically called UniMind, the UniMind program. And basically, this is an international network of journal clubs. Basically, think of it as like academic book clubs. So you get uh, researchers coming together to discuss papers, uh, new research, their research, and these are you know, facilitated by Marvin and the Mind Foundation. And they're now all over the world. They have groups all over the world, from Canada to Australia. And I think basically every European country has a group. And these people are discussing research into psychedelics, but also things related to psychedelics. So everything from politics to neuroscience, neurobiology, psychology. Uh, it's a very diverse interdisciplinary network, uh, which is the goal. That's one of the, the goals of this is to get people from different backgrounds uh, meeting and talking and networking. Uh, and Marvin explained, you know, how you can get involved. So I would encourage you to take a look at the show notes uh, at the websites there. Uh, if you're a researcher, if you're a young academic, if you're uh, an academic in general, or even if you're just someone who is interested in the topic, there is space for you within this program. They have monthly uh, moderated discussions that you can join online. Uh, and we also talked about this Friday, April 9th, a symposium that they are hosting in Maastricht, Netherlands which if you're in the Netherlands or in Europe and you want to join that, uh, you can do so in person uh, April 9th uh, in Maastricht. It's a full day uh, symposium with talks and discussions and panels and that. But if you aren't in the, in the area or can't travel to make it, uh, you can join online for free. So again, check out the websites in the show notes to find out more about both of these things, the UniMind program in general and the UniMind symposium that's happening April 9th in Maastricht, a full day of talks and discussion. Should be really interesting. Uh, and I also had a chance to talk with uh, Marvin about the Mind Foundation, how he got involved, how he was uh, you know, part of the founding group, uh, why they decided to found it, which uh, is, is a little more insight into the Mind Foundation than we've had on some of the other episodes as well. So we talked about, you know, the scientific approach, why that's such a big thing at Mind and how, you know, for me, that was one of the things that attracted me to this group and to learning about psychedelics from this group because they do have that scientific approach. We also talked about how this approach was you know, really important for from a personal standpoint for all of the founders, but that it's also become crucial, I guess, in a way for helping to acknowledge the unquantifiable aspects of consciousness. You know, we talked about things like spirituality, um, mind-body problem. There's these elements of consciousness and altered states that you can't really quantify as well with the scientific approach. But the Mind Foundation and Marvin talks about how well, we're still going to try. We're still going to have this sort of inquisitive um, scientific approach to these topics. Uh, and we also talked about how maybe this, you know, helps buffer against, you know, mistakes. If mistakes are made, you can you can look to the scientific approach and know exactly what happened and, and this kind of thing. So it was interesting to get his perspective on all that. We also talked about young people and how there is a new generation of students getting involved in this in this movement, in this psychedelic renaissance, as it's as it's so often called. And I asked him specifically, is there something about this moment or this generation that is particularly suited for the renaissance? And he had a really interesting answer. So again, thank you for being here. Check the show notes uh, for websites on how to get involved in the UniMind program, how to witness these talks. Remember the symposium in Maastricht, April 9th. That's this Friday. I'm releasing this on the Monday, so 
in a couple days, end of the week, there will be this symposium. There is still a chance to register and get tickets for the in-person event, but you can also sign up to watch online for free. So links are in the show notes for that. As always, follow me on social media at 2 brad for you That's Twitter and Instagram. Head over to the website, 2bradforyou.wordpress.com. There you will find all the ways with, with which you can get in touch with the show. And we want you to get in touch with the show. Let us know what you think of the episodes. Let us know what you like. Let us know what you don't like. Let us know what you're interested in hearing about. Um, there's a spot to leave us a voice message there. You can donate to the show if that's something that you're, you're into doing. Um, and please do subscribe follow the show wherever you're getting your podcast, rate, review, that kind of thing. Uh, it really helps our visibility. Thank you so, so much for being here. And here's my discussion with Marvin Dwimishin. Thank you, Marvin, for joining me this morning. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here, Brad. As we were kind of talking a little bit offline, I was saying, you know, my audience is probably very familiar uh, with the Mind Foundation and sort of the therapy programs that they're starting there. But you are specifically in charge of a sort of an, another initiative, we'll say, um, the UniMind, what do you call it, organization, initiative, something like that. Why don't you explain what that is? And also, if you like, you know, give us, you know, sort of your journey to mind. How did you end up in this, in this field? Mm, sure. Well, well, that's, that's sort of a already pretty vast horizon of questions. <laughs> I, I'll try to uh, answer it concisely. Okay. Um, so starting with Unimind, um, uh, easiest description, I think, would be a network. Uh, we've built a network here of academic journal clubs. Uh, it started in 2018, but maybe more on that later. Um, how I got to mind was through my own experience and dissatisfaction with um, the existing discourse on psychedelics um, uh, in the growing or emerging uh, evidence on the potentials of psychedelics for human development and medical purposes uh, and with my dissatisfaction at uh, you know the conferences and the discourse happening around it so i met henrik jung arbele um, at a psychedelic conference and uh, not to play down the value and the the, the, the joy and insightful contributions that I, that I experienced there, but somehow I felt I only connected to what Henrik said. And there was also sort of a criticism towards the field that this is sort of being um, maybe in, in the already ongoing psychedelic renaissance, almost deliberately a niche culture. Yeah. And, um, we see these potentials, evidence is growing. Um, we, we can now talk to the actual stakeholders in universities. We can build up um, an organization um, that is actually reputable and that is on the ground and serious and completely distinct from all sorts of underground gray zone illegal activities. So um, he expressed that the satisfaction connected to me and uh, we got in touch. And, and not so much later, uh, we... Um, you know, gathered a group of medical doctors. Uh, I was a student at the time uh, and other professionals and supporters to found mind. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm kind of, that's interesting because when I came across the Mind Foundation, what really st stood out to me was this, yeah, this sort of professionalism and emphasis on data and rigorous, you know, scientific, you know, inquiry um and that yeah that spoke to me as a as a you know phd student when i was doing my phd in biology uh, and it wasn't something that you saw a lot you know that i had seen a lot other than you know maps maybe in the u.s kind of yeah. um so is that what you you mean when you kind of say like i would there was a little dissatisfaction in some of the discourse that was going on that drew yeah. you to this was this this is exactly it eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, if you if you look at popular media now, you know, documentaries, reports, whatever, um, still perpetuates the sort of self-referential discourse of, you know, your phenomenology and your experiences with psychedelics. And for me, this was not the point of interest. Um, my interest was much more of the academic nature, right? And so now, especially in the recent years, since I would say 2014, 17, maybe, um, publications are exploding. We have 
every year so much more that we're seeing across disciplines. Um, so that is changing now that we're actually looking at evidence-based communications. And what MIND is doing is also science communications of you know, having these distilled findings and translating them to a larger audience. Mm -hmm. So what, what exactly were you studying at the time? What was your background? Yeah, um, I think I have a somewhat mixed background. Yeah, so I, I, I set, set out originally um, to become a teacher, actually, and I went into uh, English and Spanish. So that included, you know, cultural studies, uh, linguistics predominantly, and uh, literary studies, um, liter literature history. Um, then in my master program, I went into an American studies program here in Berlin. Uh, did a year abroad in California as well. Had a good time. Was was already set in, in my mind. Was set to to get my PhD in American studies. Obviously, I mean, I think all of you listeners probably know the the North American continent is sort of the 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 hot pot for recent or modern psychedelic culture. Mm -hmm. right? So having this interest, obviously, there's a lot to research in in um, art history, liter liter literature history and of course in the cultural history mm -hmm. surrounding psychedelic experience and uh, still now um, you know if I, if I wouldn't be so busy with mine it would have been finished by now I'm still doing a PhD in yet another area <laughs> which is uh, um, now empirical social sciences and I'm looking at, at media reception and drug prevention with a focus on cannabis. Hmm. Interesting. One of the things that I'll you know listening to your background there you know, coming from sort of literary, you know, maybe social sciences kind of thing, and then moving into the the empirical um, sociology. So again, social sciences, we'll say, but empirical stuff. What I've also mm -hmm. really enjoyed about MIND and the conferences and, and stuff is that they don't seem to shy away from the sort of gray areas. You know, it's like, yes, there is a, a focus on empirical data when we can get it, but the inherent nature of the psychedelic experience and these substances is that there's a lot of things that are actually quite difficult to pin down with numbers. We do the best we can, but then there's still this sort of openness to sort of, you know, embrace the unknown and you know, it's at the Insight Conference, you see a lot of art, you see, you know, literature, you see all of these different backgrounds about it, too. So I'm just, maybe you could just give a, your quick sort of perspective on, you know, why that's important and why Mound, Mind Foundation makes an effort to, you know, not stray too far to either side. You know, you could get too far into the sort of gray area, you know, mm -hmm. new age kind of stuff, or you could get too far into the empirical data, but there's a nice mm. sort of blend. And why do you think that's important for a field like this? Yeah, the I guess the the most puzzling and shortest answer would be that the human experience is so much more complex than <laughs> <laughs> than, than mathematics, possibly. Right? But yeah, of course, I mean, there, there are just so many relevant questions and we have uh, related to, you know, consciousness, experience, uh, cognition, altered states of consciousness and how these all tie in together and there, there's no doubt that that people are interested in all these questions and we have we have so many questions that we're not even near answering you know the mind body problem what, what what do we do about this and yeah what what for us was a a driving value that's also one of our six core values is the scientific approach as the basic tenet of everything that we do yeah um here at mind and everything that we communicate or at least we strive to do so, yeah, and we also set it as our value to account for the discrepancies if we fail to do so and be open about our mistakes. Because again, uh, it's such a rich field, and there are um, just uh, you know logical arguments, uh, philosophical inquiry, ethical questions. This is sometimes being played out on a completely independent platform from you know questions about medicalization. It's good that also people think about what are the ethics and the, the challenges we face in medicalizing psychedelics um, or access equity, but um, they, they're not always necessarily connected and obvious. So for us, it's important that we are open to all these discussions, that we also are open to talking to all stakeholders. So my, I mean, another example would be spirituality. What is it? You know, there, there, there's a, a wealth of approaches, I, I guess. You would find a bunch of definitions if you look it up. It can be synonymous to religiosity. It can also be um, a completely secular approach to to a more um, embodied embodied perception of the self. Mm -hmm. It's very unclear. So it's important that we talk about this so that we can find a consensus that in the end advances humanity. Mm -hmm. So so mind in essence using the scientific approach is quintessentially in the 
philosophical tradition of enlightenment, you know, democratic um, values, reason, critical examination of the self and your environment. Yeah, and I think that's interesting because a lot of places, you know, these, you know, you mentioned spirit, spirituality, mind-body problem, like all of these sort of philosophical or, you know, things that we would think of as not tangible. It's like an acknowledgement that, okay, maybe we can't quantify these things in a basic numbers kind of sense, but let's at least try to put yeah, and, these principles yeah. to it. Yeah, and you know, um, especially where I come from, the social sciences, it, qualitative research is not so rare, <laughs> but it's still in some 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 fields or groups uh, almost frowned upon. Um, and also, in if you look at the the, the studies that have been published in, in psychedelic research, obviously qualitative or for evident reasons, I would say, qualitative research is not the majority, and we didn't count. We, we, yeah, they, they don't count necessarily as, as, as often or in value, they don't count as much sometimes. Mm -hmm. But this is relevant. It's, um, and there, there is data that we can gain from explorative, qualitative research, from, from detailed, analyzing detailed accounts and content that we might not be able to capture with quantitative measures. Mm -hmm. So just sort of as, a, as another a bit of a tangent, I have to say, but still this is another, even a different method, you know, that's complementary. I have one more that kind of just popped up here in my head, and then we can we can dive into the uni mind thing a bit more. Mm -hmm. I feel like because you mentioned, you know, there's the ethics, uh, there's some ethical questions with this field, and then you also kind of just said having the if I'm reading you correctly that having the scientific approach and having that as sort of a core value, maybe that's a bit of a protection too, in a way again, when you do make mistakes or when there is conflicting data or something like this, because I know that this is a very, um, it can be still viewed as a risky field. And I've spoken with people at the conferences and stuff who there is some concern that if mistakes are made, if certain groups are different, you know, if a bat, if a negative story comes out about, mm -hmm. you know, a psychedelic treatment or something, I just saw a negative story released in, in Canada just the other day. It's like, how do we, you know, people are worried that the movement will get shut down sort of similar to what happened in say like mm -hmm. the 60s, 70s kind of thing. But do you think that having that sort of making sure that this idea of critical thinking, scientific approach up front helps maybe buffer some of that in a way you could be like, look at, we can acknowledge mistakes, we can show you the data, we can show you what's working, what's yeah. not, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, um, I think all of the, the core actors here at MIND naturally or, or maybe organically subscribe to the scientific approach. That's one of the reasons why we are who we are. On the other hand side, I mean, what, what you just described, we've had these discussions, especially in the formative years. You know, we are now in year six of MIND. And in the first one or two years, we're still finding our place, carving out our our niche in public discourse here yeah, and developing our profile. We've had these discussions over and over again, of course, these concerns, you know, what happens if, you know, there are, there was in 2009, there was a huge setback to the field. Andrea, I know, was already um, planning a, a clinical psychedelic study back then, and it looked like they were, were going to get ethical approval and so on and so forth. Then an underground therapist really fucked up, you know, mm -hmm. and we don't, we do not condone, uh, we don't endorse un any underground activities at all. And so here we have a perfect example. This person made a huge mistake. I think two people died in this treatment and it set back the entire field, the entire discourse in Europe by years. That's exactly it. So um, in a nutshell, uh, the scientific approach is not instrumental to to us becoming serious actors in the field. No, this is our personal mo intrinsic motivation, but it is also, of course, very important to have a very clear profile with when you're dealing with a topic that is only now re-entering the public arena in a, in a more respectable light. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a topic that has, let's face it, kind of a, a bit in some circles, in a lot of circles, you know, you talk about North America as being like sort of the hotbed of this stuff. It's also the most demonized in that mm -hmm. in North America, you know, in the US with the with the drug laws and stuff like that. Like, so there is a bit of a reputation for people um, of this field. So to kind of bring it back and bring it back into the public sphere, I understand that sort of delicate balance, you know, and it's, I'm actually quite amazed at the movement that's happening uh, in places like the US, like even just cannabis, you know, the fact that they 
the certain states legalized cannabis before Canada did. I, I was always shocked. And as a Canadian, I was a little like, oh, they beat us to it. You know, that should have been us. But uh, yeah, so to see this conflicting thing, like, you know, like I said, the 60s, 70s, the backlash, that kind of thing. But to now see what's happening, you know, in Oregon and Canada and other places, it's it's really interesting. But I really, I really kind of respect the fine line that people are trying to walk in terms of, I don't want to say legitimizing it, because I do, I think that there's, I, I can see some value in the therapy and stuff like that, you know, but it's, um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a delicate balance you guys got you guys are walking. So yeah, I would maybe speak of rehabilitation in mm. a way, and there's no denying that's in, a good in, word. Yeah, yeah, there's no denying of the social misadventures adventures that happened in the sixties, and and the actors that started out with whatever motivation we can only guess, especially Leary, you know, following up on Skinner and the uh, behaviorism and the black box. So. Um, I won't go further. Yeah, uh, it, we we can we can look at different reasons, but uh, the discussion will not end. And I think uh, each side has their their arguments speaking for them. I mean, we could go off on a tangent here. Yeah. I think for <laughs> for a while. So I know we have a limited amount of time. So I'll I'll try and keep it a bit more focused. But uh, so let's uni mind. You you described it as a network of journal clubs. So for yes. folks that aren't uh, maybe familiar with the term journal club. I mean, it's a pretty common thing in academia where you get, you know, people in related fields or within your field together, you know, once a week, whatever it is, once a month and discuss a recent finding, a recent paper that's been released in, in your field. And it's a, it's a chance to, you know, meet, discuss, uh, generate new ideas, you know, maybe critique uh, studies it seems like it's a very natural part of the of the scientific mm. process bringing people together and stuff so this is what uni mind is but it's not just you guys in berlin doing it you're facilitating groups around the world really yeah facilitating um uh, again there's, there's there's so much in your in your opener i don't really know where to start <laughs> um, i tend to do that i tend to to just so just take it where you want <laughs> yeah sure um, so I think your description of, of the typical journal clubs was accurate. Yeah? The peculiarities or the particularities of Unimind are, I think, that especially in, in, this, in these individual cells and in these individual groups of this now global network, you have a, 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 a large diversity of uh, disciplinary backgrounds. Also, different academic levels. Uh, you know, most groups are run by students of you know undergrad, grad students, or PhD candidates. A couple of them have faculty in the in the organizers. We call them coordinators of a group, and in the participants, it's also very mixed. And they come, you know, as as I opened our conversation today, from all sorts of different uh, backgrounds and have individual questions and challenges and needs. So. Um, while the discussions might not always be on the on the with that same focus that you would have in one group from one research program in the in the grad uh, neurosciences group or whatever, you know? uh, so sometimes it will still have to introduce basic concepts to a philosopher when you're talking about a neuroscience paper. But in essence, that's what they are doing. They discuss academic publications. But then still, that's not all. We make it very explicit. So there, there's a bunch of of recommendations that we give here at Mind, how to run the groups and what material you can use. And I, I think it's important to also look at academic talks, for example, where inside conferences are accessible to our community. They're brilliant presentations from which you might, in some cases, learn much more than from reading one paper. Or students increasingly are discussing their own research projects, the theses or the term papers, whatever it is. And again, increasingly, it's becoming more psychedelics focused in the presentations that focus on their own project. So I see that psychedelic research on the student level has already sort of started maybe consolidating a little bit. Then, of course, the discussion is not limited to psychedelic questions or topics. So anything related to the brain, mind, philosophy, uh, ethics, you name it, is, is welcome there. You know, this is a place for students or platform that we've built with this network for students to learn from with another uh, horizontally as well as word, vertically. So then there's like, there's each, there's these people sort of register to be kind of like a, a leading a group in their little mm -hmm. institution. And then there's these groups sort of all over the world. Are the groups like sort of individually in that one locale, are, are they quite in, interdisciplinary already at that level? Or is oh, it yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
and uh, you know, in invitedly so. We want that. We want to promote. Um, so the scientific approach, yes, we've talked about that. We're also um, pursuing a transdisciplinary uh, scientific approach or a transdisciplinary approach to science. And so it's, it's not just relevant to develop new and effective solutions to the real world problems that we're facing today, that you, know, you have to synthesize disciplines, you have to look at theories and methods from other disciplines be beyond, your, beyond your plate, but also to apply these to practice. You know, as, as you mentioned, MIND is also training psychotherapists. We have an integration program with uh, workshops that are more on the experiential side and, and learning to work with yourself after your experience. So all this, in a way, is acknowledged, even though, you know, the experiential side is not part of Uniman. So there are discussion groups um, that are very interdisciplinary on on all sorts of levels. And that shows in the local groups as well as in international exchanges that we have their different formats. See that, yeah, I mean, that seems like it, it should be more of a, just an overall lesson for for academics and, and science in general, I think, is is increased interdisciplinary, um, mm. you know, meetings or whatever it is. I know like in my experience from, you know, journal clubs when I was doing my PhD in biology, nothing to do with psychedelics at all but it was very much you know we stayed within our sort of little group we might have you know related labs coming and, and giving presentations and stuff but it was really and obviously there's value in that you know because you need to know what's going on within your scope in order to mm. complete your project and stuff but i think that beyond just you know we think of psychedelics as that's where we can bring in all of these neuroscience philosophy all of this stuff but i think just in general mm. how great mm. would it be for biology students to interact with philosophers and clinicians mm. and veterinarians or something like that because i think people tend to underestimate how much or we forget how much philosophy is involved in in mm. science in knowledge building so i think it's mm. a it's an interesting it's a good model that i think a lot of people could could follow yes yes of course it also comes with increased complexity it can be immensely daunting you know to students that are just sort of getting into their specific resort of science. So, um, yeah, I mean, I agree. Well, and like you said, you got to then kind of sort of have a way to cover basic terms yeah. and, and whatnot to get everybody on the same page, yeah. more or less. But I don't know. I think it's, I don't, again, people who have listened to me on, on, on this show know that I'm such a big advocate of, of these sort of transdisciplinary things because this is how the big discoveries are made, right? When mm. you take a piece of knowledge from one totally unrelated field and realize, oh, hey, it can fit in here as well. But yeah, so in these groups, you know, you got all these different things going on. And again, and I think, you know, we I mentioned earlier, maybe it was offline, that you, my audience might not realize what the scope of sort of what we would call sort of psychedelic research really is, you know, because there is from your know, basic neurobiology to neuroscience to clinical work the therapy work sociology psychology that's all getting discussed in unimind so i'm just curious what what you know sort of topic areas are you seeing in the in in coming in the recent you know time that's got you kind of excited and maybe you could give us just yeah sort of a slice of all the different things that are you see happening in a way i i guess i guess it would be correct to say unimind is sort of my brainchild i was I was inspired to create this network um, upon learning from a friend in support of mine that he had a, a journal club in, in Heidelberg here in Germany. You know? He's a neuroscientist and uh, I think it was also a mixed group. There were social work students and all, all sorts of different topics in there. And so we started this and in that was end of 2018. And so in the first year, you know, we got like five to 10 groups. Now it's almost 30. And what happened, as we all know, is the pandemic you know, it really accelerated trends that we are that we were already seeing towards globalization, you know, delocalization in the way of, of exchange, um, the internationalization of, of uh, academic community. And, you know, science was always international. And that led us to develop different formats. Um, I think it's relevant to touch upon this because I, I in my sort of bird's eye perspective onto the network, I'm, I'm looking at the infrastructure, I'm building the formats. I, I help groups emerge. I'm not so present in most local mm -hmm. groups. I have, I keep track. I try, but um, yeah. I can only talk about uh, my personal experience when you ask me what papers are, are discussed um, that goes uh, beyond local groups or different formats that we have. So um, now to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
uh, we uh, end of last year we started a new format. So seeing that you know groups have started to organize online since I mean, for two years by now, and uh, that groups are also meeting, but, uh, have, having joint meetings. You know, one group in the Netherlands with another group in Zurich have, have a shared session. I thought, why not activate this network that we have at mind? You know, being known as we are now, for me also having the network, why not activate this network and invite authors of research publications to join us for a monthly session to discuss with us, with me most of the time as a moderator, uh, one of the publications with our audience and anybody from anywhere can join, whether they're already in UniMind or not. And uh, so I, I had a, a lovely experience with Colin Wright, who's a psychiatrist at New York University, um, and he published a paper called Psychedelics and Psychedelic Assisted Psychotherapy. It is a fairly comprehensive and, and very well, uh, so it's it's wonderful introductory paper if you want to understand um, the the the, lands, the existing landscape of clinical trials and psychedelics across substances with you know different sections for different substances and describing the methodological challenges as well as the findings, how do they relate, uh, wonderful paper. So that is really in the clinical field. I had a great discussion, it was lovely. So that was something I particularly enjoyed. And, and you know, I, 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 once again, I keep track, but I'm not so deep in it, so let me think. Another one is, um, that also shows a bit mobility. We have Anna, who uh, ran the UniMind Utrecht group in the Netherlands. She was a psychology master's student, I think, and did a presentation on a rebus and the anarchic brain. So that's you know neuroscience, cognitive science. It's a card, a card Harris Friston and uh, paper, um, very influential. It gives sort of a, a theoretical model of. Um, what actually happens on the psychedelics. And that's what Rebus also means. She moved to Berlin and she took over the Berlin group in UniMinds organizing that now. So that's that's also, there was a very interesting uh, discussion that I attended. Luckily, we have this direct exchange with somebody from the background that's always a neuroscientist. And so if I, as a, as a, as a social sciences scholar, do not understand basic concepts, um, I can ask. And um, another one is, for example, Jonas from Uni Maastricht, uh, with whom we're also organizing the upcoming symposium next week at uh, Maastricht University. He wrote a special thesis on the, I, I don't know the exact details, but it was about the, the effects of psychedelics on romantic relationships. Very interesting topic. Yeah? And I think also from a hmm. psychological perspective, possibly. Yeah, I think he even gave, uh, made it a, paper, a poster presentation for the Last Insight Conference. Uh, then on, on another end of the spectrum, um, we have uh, a an, an really excellent group that faced huge uh, bureaucratic challenges to come into existence. Now they're thriving. They are located in Romania. Um, Eugene and Joanna, they're running it. Inclusion at Boca Romania. Yeah. Um, they had, for example, they have a very good syllabus. So every semester, their, their sessions build up upon each other. They're also PhD students, so they have experience and professors involved. Uh, they were discussing uh, Thomas Metzinger's um, philosophical essay on Bewusstseinskultur, which is also an approach that we um, uh, endorse here at MIND. Thomas is also part of our scientific advisory board. And, you know, again, uh, different topics, uh, philosophical, cognitive science topics, such as a discussion on cognitive liberty that my colleague Patrick did a while ago here. Had, had, there was no mention of psychedelics, which is great, you know, because this field is so much bigger and we should not limit ourselves to the sort of, hey, what about the substances? No, 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 it goes, it goes much further. Maybe another last example that I observed, we have a, a, um, a lovely group in Australia so um, that is actually having a session right now. You know, you and me are having a conversation in the morning. There it's evening, and um, they're they're having a session right now, and they invited for today the author of a commentary paper that that we read last year, which was titled or which is titled "Why Was Early Research on Psychedelic Substances Abandoned?" And so he goes, it's it's fairly mm. short, but in a way he goes at length to uh, you know what I now call the social misadventures of the 60s and also you know shows us right. things that we maybe weren't aware the, the the US American government funded psychedelic research well until the 1970s in Spring Grove in Maryland Bill Richards and these guys that are with Johns Hopkins now um, so there was a wonderful paper it's more of the, the the political backgrounds and the 
background of, of the, the demonization, as you mentioned earlier, that became at the end of the 60s. Now, that same group also has a, um, so Ricardo, who runs the group, has quite a few publications accumulated by now. So he wrote a paper on bioethical challenges on the medicalization of psychedelics. And I touched upon this earlier. You know, so it's, it's also, it feels so good to discuss the research publications in another group by one of your coordinators on the other end of the world. So all this kind of ties in together. I love it. No, that's great. And I mean, just like, I'm going to have to follow up with you afterwards to get links to some of these and, and get, get some of those papers because I'd love to check some of them out. I know some of the audience probably would as well. And then, you know, you mentioned the, the upcoming symposium, which I want to get to in just a second, but I have just one more that I wanted to ask you first, which is, you know, you're seeing... Yeah, I called it a, a, a youth movement. Like there's a lot of young students that are kind of getting into this, mm. this field. Um, and when I go to Insight, I see a lot of uh, uh, young people. And maybe that's just natural for a field that's, that's reemerging or something like that. But do you see that? Do you see something about uh, something of, a, you know, maybe youth movement's the wrong word, but do you see that sort of emerging? And if so, what do you think is unique maybe about this next generation of psychedelic researchers mm. that's really going to help mm. push the field forward. So among young people and um, yeah, I mean, in, in a way, the segment that we're looking at in mind is uh, in the academic field. You know? There is a lot of a lot of movement, but not in the uh, political activist sense of the word, but there is a great uh, high degree of dynamic now. And uh, as I said, I see more and more of our of our network having their own theses, their own projects, or um, applying with posters or presentations at a conference that are related to psychedelic research, independent of discipline. So there's a lot happening. And uh, I would call it probably a revitalization of an on-the-ground interest in questions related to altered states of consciousness and psychedelics that are, I think, a, a natural byproduct, so to speak, for, of the psychedelic renaissance that we're in. This rehabilitation of discourse on psychedelics also now empowers people, students, I mean, let's let's be honest. Young people have always been interested. Humanity has always been interested in altered states of consciousness. There's no denying. And um, there was a mm -hmm. long ice age in which nobody would talk about it. And I think a, a distinct and, and then also a, a very diverse subculture, you know, the side trans culture, and so many different cultures involving psychedelics and altered states have developed. But only now, young people, I think also Unimind is having part in this. Young people in, in academe are finally getting a feeling of assertiveness. Yes, this is a legitimate pursuit. But my intellectual interest in this topic mm -hmm. is, is uh, legitimate. I can do this. And we're also giving them the network. Mm -hmm. So that's a sense of belonging, gives them a back of this confidence. And we're giving them the tools by educating them with our output and having them educate each other in the journal clubs. So yes, there's a lot of movement and a lot mm -hmm. more young students are going into this. I think also on a tiny scale, but it's happening in our uh, central sessions that we have every month with our authors. You know, the authors are very approachable, lovely people. And, you know, who doesn't love to talk about their, their passionate work and what they published? Um, that's also a wonderful connecting point for, for students to learn, you know, how does it, what does it mean to publish science? What is the background? What are the framing conditions? What are the motivations? And who are the people behind these this, this academic work, this sort of ivory tower work, how do I, how do I place myself? What, what is my, my relation to this? I think this opens up this, this field of work for students to understand that it's not weird and it's, it's not unusual to, to have a very particular scientific interest and pursue that with your full passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's kind of like a, you know, pe young people are, are, they view it now as like, well, this is a legitimate field that I can go into. And there's all these options of connecting it to different work that I'm doing and that kind of thing. I'm always kind of interested in that. And, you know, seeing, you know, it's a, it's a, more people are coming into the field younger because of that legitimacy, we'll say, that's being brought to it. But I'm also, you know, if I look at sort of broader trends in youth mental health topics, there's, there's this, I've seen, you know, articles and everything like this about how young people are maybe less risky than they were before. So taking less substances, you know, engaging in less sex, you know, and then also having, you know, higher levels of anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if there's maybe, and this is, you know, kind of just my speculation, so I don't expect you to have like a hard answer or anything, but I'm just curious as to your thoughts on this. It's like, maybe there's something, 
you know, young people, if they are feeling this anxiety and stuff, they can see, well, there's this, you know, again, new treatment, you know, and even beyond treatment, there's something going on here that might help with that. But then it's kind of contradicted by this, you know, less risky behavior because, you know, maybe you, know, you, you think of taking a substance or a psychedelic as sort of, you know, taking drugs or this ris risky behavior. Do you think that there's something with young people right now that might make them either scared of the movement or, or attracted to it? Obviously, there's going to be different people at, at different times. But I don't know, again, a very broad sort of statement to put to you. But... Yeah, but this time I feel like I can answer it more concisely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, what what I perceive, and this may be maybe biased, but the way I see it is, I think there's a greater attraction to to discussion on innovative and promit, promising mental health treatments. There's greater awareness uh, in culture and much more discourse and quantity over uh, um, uh, psychiatric disorders for sure. Yeah, um, if you look at uh, even now, you know, it is it is still. A sensitive to topic to talk about your emotional, mental problems, but this is this is sort of slowly dissolving and becoming more normal to talk about the subject. So people are more prone to discuss this and also to look into this. Along with this comes a greater like likelihood that people also disclose such problems that they have, and everybody knows somebody that has had uh, that has struggled with depression, right? Everybody, and so. There's more discourse, mm -hmm. there's more people talking about it. Uh, obviously, with the pandemic, mental health is such a big issue. Then it's also a generational thing that um, I, I, I read a, a post by, by Microsoft, actually, the other day. Um, they analyzed uh, trillions of data points from, you know, all the teams, Outlook, all anonymized, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> They, they, they analyzed an immense amount of data and found, you know, younger people, Gen Z, millennials, more likely to emphasize the importance of their own well-being, mental health over uh, their workplace. That is, that is changing. So we're seeing a generational shift here. Also, more people are considering changing location for their workplace or changing their workplace if they don't don't feel at ease or don't feel like it's conducive to their well-being as compared to previous generations. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's a greater openness and, 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 and a bigger focus on mental health and well-being in the new generation or young people now. And at the same time, mm -hmm. so maybe it's not as concise as I promised it would be, at the same time, <laughs> with the re-entering of, of, uh, of um, let's say, uh, a positive psychology on substance use and, and psychoactive substances into the mainstream, it's just much more likely that people will catch wind. Once again, I mentioned popular media now. It's everywhere these days you know and so um, yeah there's there's everybody has heard of psychedelics and it really it it doesn't the interest and the openness really doesn't have to come out of some sort of diffuse youth rebellion you know government tells me this is bad i'm going to take drugs no a lot of people such as in our group here we we have a, first an academic interest and the the contact points are just manifold nowadays. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, it's not like what what you just said there. How it's not coming from this sort of reactionary counterculture mm. kind of backlash thing. It's it's more of this sort of awakening, realization, and a positive <clears throat> excuse me psychology. Really interesting. And again, we could go off on a whole nother tangent there. But let's. Let's give people the information then on the Uni Mind Symposium that's happening April 9th, because this is another way that people who are interested can get into the get into mm. learning about this movement. Because, well, I'll let you give give us the details of what the Uni Mind Symposium is and, and how people can get yeah, involved. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, this is really the year's every year's highlight. Um, so as I sort of, you know, went over during a discussion, we have basically three main format types. We have the local groups that also uh, act online or uh, across groups with a regular group sessions. Secondly, we have the monthly Unimind Central sessions, which are moderated sessions with invited authors. And the third one is the now annual Unimind Symposium. Uh, it took place for the first time uh, with the uh, Zürich, University of Zürich last year. Uh, un unfortunately, due to the pandemic online, but we still had a turnout of about 200 attendees. It was great. Um, had some of the greats speaking as, oh. as keynote speakers, a lot of young 
young, young students. And this year is the second iteration. It's taking place on April 9 at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, which is one of the hotspots in Europe for psychedelic research. This is also one of the, you know, the flagships where you can see they're already including courses on psychedelic, psychedelic topics, psychedelic medicine in the master programs. <clears throat> <clears throat> That's something we're going to be seeing much more in the coming years, I'm sure. So uh, the goal, the idea of the Union Mind Symposium is to to create yet another platform, uh, you know, a, a physical platform at a university every year where students and experts get together, or juniors and seniors, if you will, get together, give talks, you know, one after another. Um, we have discussion formats. This time there's a, there's a particularly creative discussion format, I think. And really to, to give the, the next generation a, a chance to be in front of an audience, present their research topics related to psychedelics and related inquiries and uh, discuss the network. So this time it's this time it's co-organized by the uh, Maastricht University Department of Psychopharmacology. So we have, uh, you know, the head of department, Jan Ramakers, Kim Kuypers is uh, speaking, also helped us co-organize it. Natasha Mason and, and a bunch of PhD candidates, just because this is such a hotspot. And then we have our coordinators from Unimind Yale, for example. He's, he's traveling, he's giving a talk. Um, we have people from Germany, from all over the world joining us for this event. And so... People can, if they're in the area of Maastricht or want to travel uh, on short notice, April 9th, uh, to to get there, they can get tickets for the online or for the in person event. But it's also you can you can join online. Yeah, yeah. So again, this is one of those developments of the the pandemic, I would say. And uh, generally, Unimind is 100 percent part of of uh, it's it's quintessentially a public benefit enterprise or activity if you will we we charge 10 euros for the on-site tickets it's a full day with uh 10 10 presentations a group discussion then we have a panel discussion and uh you know lots of networking opportunities and so on and so forth i don't have to market it i just want to say it's um really for, for the public benefit the tickets are 10 euros it's a symbolic price and we we got a we got a grant. We were lucky to get a grant from uh, the Universitätsfond Limburg. So shout out to these guys. Thank you for the money and making this possible. And the ten euros uh, ticket fee is really just to refinance the event. And online participation is completely free. So you can just go to our website, sign up. We'll send you the the live stream link just before the event, and you know you can join us at your leisure. Again, last year two hundred people tuned in for for a day long online day. And uh, that was that was a good turnout. I'm mm -hmm. very happy and thankful that people also seem to appreciate what we're doing here. Yeah, and um, I'll make sure to link that website in the show notes for anyone that's interested in uh, in participating online. It's April 9th, beginning at mm -hmm. nine thirty a.m. Central European time. So if you if you're in another time zone, make sure to to set your watch. But thank you, Marvin, for for coming on and and and. Indulging my long-winded, uh, broad questions, and, and for letting us know about Unimind and the Unimind Symposium. Before I let you go, is there anything else that you wanted to mention that that I didn't didn't bring up or, or didn't touch uh, on? Not really. Just uh, for your listeners, if, if this this made Unimind interesting, if you're wondering if this could be something for you, no matter what level you are in academe, don't be don't be scared. Reach out to us. Get in touch. Um, coordinating a group is, I think, a a great opportunity for you to in increase your your academic skills your network, your understanding. Uh, so also, you know, getting the tools and the instruments that you need in science and to get deeper into psychedelics and psychedelic research. I am very grateful for this international community that we now have. As, you know, I mentioned, it spans from, you know, the, the furthest west we have is in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. There's one group. And we have a couple in the United mm -hmm. States. Europe has groups in almost every country now. And uh, then you go all the way down to Brisbane, Western Australia, Eastern Australia, in Australia. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's so beautiful to see how this network grows and how they interact with each other. And, you know, these people will be, uh, these guys will be the next therapists, the next generation of professors or other stakeholders in, 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 in society. So um, I think the work that is being done here is so valuable. And what we're doing here in mind, we're really just creating the, the architecture. It could really lives on the community mm -hmm. itself and, and thrives on them. So anybody who's already in Unimind that's listening to, to this podcast, thank you for being part of this and making it what it is. Yeah, so yeah, definitely. I would I would say people that are interested, uh, I've found the Mind Foundation to be a great uh, welcoming 
resource to get into the field and and and, and just see what's going on. So I can I can, <laughs> I can vouch for that. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much, Marvin. It's been it's yeah, been a pleasure yeah, to speak yeah. with you. Um, pleasure is mine. Once again, a big, big thanks to Marvin for joining the show, taking taking time out of his busy day to uh, talk to us about the UniMind program and the symposium that's coming up April 9th in Maastricht. Again, you can join online for free. Just register uh, via the website, which is in the show notes. And like I said at the end there, the Mind Foundation has been really great uh, to me uh, in terms of getting involved and just participating in, you know, lectures, conferences, that kind of thing. And so if you are interested in the topic, I, I do think that this is a good place to start. Uh, they have a scientific approach, so you're going to get information that's a bit more grounded uh, in, in, in fact and science. Um, and they're really, really about promoting a healthy uh, use of these things. So, so, yeah, as far as resources to, to, to get involved in, in learning more about psychedelics and the, again, so-called psychedelic renaissance that's happening, uh, I think Mind Foundation is a, a safe bet. Thank you for listening. As always, follow me on uh, social media, at 2 brad for you That's Twitter and Instagram. Head over to the website, 2 brad for youwordpresscom uh, find all the information on how to get in touch with us. Please do get in touch with us. Uh, subscribe, follow, rate, review, wherever you get your podcasts. Helps us out a lot. Uh, leave us a voice message. That's all on the website, tobradforyou.wordpress.com. Send us an email. Let us know what you think. Uh, donate to the show if that's something you're into. Uh, and stay tuned. In a couple weeks, we'll have another episode about ivermectin. But not what you think. This time, we are going to get from an expert, from my former PhD supervisor and good friend, John Gilliard, we are going to get the true history of ivermectin. That's right. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and until next time, take care and bye for now. <laughs>